So we always ask ourselves, what is a computer? So what, what was the definition that we came up with? Yeah, hardware and software working together to perform a task, okay? But that's pretty, that's pretty generic, <clears throat> but we have to kind of boil it down just a little bit further to really understand what's going on, okay? So you can think about the hardware part of it as being digital hardware that is designed, okay? And it's desi you basically build a bunch of hardware that can do specific operations, okay? And a real conceptual map of how this might look is, let's just say you had a finite state machine. Okay, so you have a finite state machine, and it's banging away, it does this, it does that, and then at some point it goes down this path in order to accomplish one, what we call, let's just call it an operation, I don't know why. Okay, and then let's say there's another one right here, maybe it only takes a couple states, and then maybe this one over here just takes, eh, it would take three, whatever, whatever. Okay, <clears throat> and at the end, these all kind of return to the same state up here, and they repeat. Okay. So you have this state machine, and let's just say that it can do three operations. And an operation is essentially one path from start through one of these paths. Okay? So that would be operation one. So that would be op one. And then another one would be you come through this path, and that might be a second operation that you decided you wanted this thing to do. Okay? This is hardware. Okay? <clears throat> and then another one might be this guy right here, which is op three. So you've created a piece of hardware that can do three operations. All right. <clears throat> you tell the hardware which operation that you want it to do at any given time by giving it a code. Okay. And why don't we just call it an operation code? Because you're telling the hardware which operation to do. Okay. So let's call it an operation code. And you provide this as ones and zeros, and the state machine looks at it at this point right here, where it takes the operation code and decides which path to take through the hardware in order to do its thing, to do the operation. Okay? Now, if you think about this, <clears throat> the operation code is provided to the hardware, but wouldn't it be cool to have multiple operation codes that this thing could do? Okay? In fact, what if we made a list of operation codes? Okay? You know, the word operation just takes a long time to say. Why don't we just call it op code? You want to do that? Okay, operation, it just ugh, ugh, takes forever. We'll never get through the material. So why don't we just call this an op code? Okay? And what if we said we're going to provide a sequence of op codes, okay? or operation codes, and whatever, whatever. And we put them out here, so we got like op1, and then we do op2, and then we do, I don't know, let's do op3. Then let's do op3 again. <clears throat> you know, there's really no limit to what we do here. Okay. In fact, we are going to provide a sequence of operations that are over here, op codes, let's say. And what we want to do is we want to build the hardware so that it can automatically go out and grab these operation codes. Okay? Because if it can do that, then all I really need to do is take all the operation codes and put them somewhere, and then say go, and the hardware will go out and grab these puppies one at a time and execute them. Okay? So in this kind of scenario, you could actually break down what the hardware is doing into three kind of distinct tasks. Okay? These states up here, the reason I draw them as a sequence of states that every operation does, is because they handle what's called the fetch. And the fetch is where the hardware goes out and it grabs the operation to be executed. Okay? So it might go out and grab like the first puppy there and say, oh, thank you. And it brings it over to here. And what it needs to do once it gets that operation code is something that's called decode. So the decode. I mean, there's a, boy, did I spell it D-E-O? Boy, from your angle, it looks like deed. Let me just start over. D code, and it takes that operation code, and it looks at it and says, oh, this sequence of bits means go down this path right here. Or it's a different one, and it says go down this path, or it's a different one and go down this path. So we decode that code, the op code, and then what we do is once we know what it's trying to do, we go down one of the paths, okay, and that would then be called the execute. Okay? And the execute's different, okay? So for opcode one, the execute states were those. Okay? For opcode two, they were these. For opcode three, they were these. 
Okay? And what we got to do is we just have to build this hardware so that it can automatically go out, grab an opcode, decode it, do its execution, and then go back and do it again. But we need the hardware in up, up here in this fetch state to automatically know where to go get the next opcode. So for just as the most simple example, let's just say the computer then goes directly to the next opcode of memory, or wherever this stuff is, and then grabs that opcode, executes it. Then it goes to this one, grabs that opcode, executes it. Goes to this opcode, grabs it, executes it. Okay? All right. That's the concept of hardware. Now, the concept of software is this. <clears throat> Where should we put all these opcodes? Why don't we put them? Let's, we could put them with dip switches. Okay, we could have a dip switch, you know, like your breadboard, remember the dip switches? And we could have one for each opcode. And we could put them on a, on a breadboard, <clears throat> and we could just program the computer by going tick, tick, tick. Okay, that's opcode one. Okay, and then tick, tick, tick. I'm going to do opcode one again, then tick, 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 opcode three. And you could build up this sequence of operations that the computer is going to do. Okay, but that's stupid, right? Because it's going to take a lot of dip switches. Now, we could put all of these codes into a memory system. Wouldn't that be cool? So we could actually take this and put it into memory. <clears throat> and it's not just memory, it's program memory. I mean, this is where we're going to put essentially what we call the program. But all those opcodes sit in a memory system. And this fetch component of the finite state machine knows how to go out to the memory, <clears throat> grab the opcode, bring it over, and decode it. And if you think about this being in the concept of a memory system, how do you tell it which opcode to go get? You provide an address. So you provide an address, and then you read from it, <clears throat> and the opcode comes over into the hardware, and then you decode it, and then you execute it. And if this is the concept of a memory, then all you need to do is take your address that you're currently driving over to the memory system and change it to the next value. In this situation, it could be the next address. Okay? It might be two addresses down. It might be 10 addresses down. But that will be influenced by what you're actually doing. So this is the software component. We're talking about the bits that represent the operations that the hardware will perform. Not only just which ones they're going to do, the order of which ones they're going to do, the sequence of looping that you're going to do, because you know just this, this is kind of stupid because we're just going to keep going through. Pretty soon we're going to start executing code that's not there. We're not going to have the, an opcode, and the computer just crashes. So we're, we know we're going to have to at least tell this puppy to come back and start cycling through the same opcodes. So that would be a looping structure. And then sometimes you might have some operations which selectively jump over different opcodes. So you go op1, op2. Oh, op2 said, don't do this one. No way. I'm jumping down here and continuing. And that would be a decision like an if-then statement. Okay. So what software is, is what you decide to be the codes that you will put into this program memory that will be executed by the hardware. Does that feel good? OK, so that's kind of the cartoon explanation of what a computer is. But it does illustrate this whole notion of hardware and software working together. OK, OK. Let us break this down a little bit more. Okay, Let us draw what actually the hardware looks like in a little bit more detail. OK? First of all, we call the hardware the circuitry that's in there. Okay. Now, within what we the, kind of the finite state machine stuff, that was going to be everything over here, and we group this as a central processing unit. That state machine that I drew really is there, and it's called the control unit because the control unit knows what to do. Okay. We also need storage next to the finite state machine because we're going to be bringing information over. For example. We're going to bring an opcode over into this part right next to the finite state machine. We need to grab it and hold it so we can decode it. Okay? So we know we need, we need at least some storage. So at a minimum, we need one register just to hold the operation. Okay? And then we'll also have some other storage over there. But this storage that sits right next to the finite state machine, register. Okay? But it's just like the VHDL registers that we've been doing, 8-bit, 16-bit, uh, just registers. Okay? You know what else we do, though? Sometimes when we get some data, we manipulate it. Huh? Wouldn't that be cool? We might take some data, and we might invert all the bits, just because we can. You know what else we might do? We might take two pieces of information. We might add them together. 
Okay, that's something that's fun to do, right? So within this central processing unit, we are also going to have a group of hardware which is called the arithmetic logic unit, or the ALU. And that is all of the combinational logic that we decide to put in there to support operations that manipulate data. Okay? Add, subtract, multiply, two's complement, negation, shift left, shift right, invert, whatever you want to do. Okay? It's up to you. Sky's the limit. All right, all right. <clears throat> now, would you call program memory hardware? The memory itself, okay, the actual transistors that sit out here, whether they're SRAM, DRAM, those, that is hardware. Okay? The circuitry itself is the hardware. So we call program memory, we actually call it hardware. All right? What about the bits, the ones and zeros that are stored within the program memory? What is that? The bits that represent the sequence and the loops of the operations that we're going to execute. What do you think that is? That's software. Okay, so the software refers to what we insert into the program memory. Program memory is, of course, hardware. But this is where the notion of hardware and software comes to, comes to be. Okay, now this is awesome. This describes everything we have, except when we do computations, when we have hardware that's doing something, sometimes we know that we need interim storage. Okay, so if we're going to store, if we're going to add like 10 numbers together, we know we have limitations where we might be able to only add two at a time. So we might add two, hold the result, and then add another one to it, then hold the result, and then add another one to it. So we're always going to have this need for interim storage, okay? so for like variables that our program is going to, do, to use. And we call that data memory. <clears throat> okay? So this now is hardware. Okay? It is going to be SRAM, DRAM, whatever. But it is going to be the type of memory which we can read and write to under a normal program operation. Okay? So if I was, had program memory and I had data memory, program memory would be considered ROM. Okay? Because once you put your program in there and you say go, you don't want to mess with it anymore. Okay? Now, I put my information in there <clears throat> and I say go. For this simple computer that we're going to look at, what do you think I mean when I say go? Clock? How about clock's best friend? Reset. <laughs> I don't know if they're friends. But reset is where you tell the system, go. And the reset, if you think about going back to our little cartoon example right here, we know that if we're going to have this state machine, and it's going to be clocking. The clock, as soon as you power it on, the clock's going to be banging. It's just a crystal, and it's going to provide the clock. But at some point, we need to tell the thing, you need to start doing what you're going to do at a known state. And that, in this state machine, is usually going to be this puppy up here, which is, you know, it's the reset state. But it's always going to be the same state that the computer starts at. Okay? So when I say go, what I mean is you hit reset, and this thing starts executing at this very top state, whatever you decide it to be. You don't want to start executing right here because you're halfway through an execution. You always start up here where you know you're going to go out to program memory and fetch the first operation code, decode it, and then execute whatever it was. Okay? All right, all right. <clears throat> so I feel so good that that's ROM. Data memory, should this be ROM or read-write? Yeah, read-write because we're going to write to it. When you start up, nothing's in here. Okay? You don't know what is in there. In, in fact, it's basically, it's usually going to be DRAM or SRAM. And so it powers up. There's no reset on a memory system. So you have no idea what's in here. So you never assume that there's information in the data memory that you could use. In order for there be, to be information, you have to write to it. But you can hold the, that information in here and then go read from it later. So you're always going to have this notion of data memory. Okay? Then we need an input and an output. Because everything we've talked about could exist without any human interaction. Once we put our program on there, we may never mess with it again. It would actually, you could build it to run. But that doesn't help humanity, does it? We don't build the computers to like go off and have, you know, meaningful lives without us, <laughs> right? We build them to serve us. So we need a way to do inputs and outputs, okay? We call the inputs and the outputs ports, okay? Inputs and outputs of a computer are things that you think about. Okay? It's like a monitor. That's an output. That helps us. An input would be keyboard and mice okay? or a mouse. 
And you said, and it's like that's input into the computer. Outputs of the computer might not necessarily be stuff that humans can see like a monitor. It could be things like an internet connection, like Ethernet. Okay? That is something we, we don't observe. It's passing information to another computer, but it is an input and an output. Okay? We're not sitting there messing with it. Same thing with like USB. That would be an input and an output, but we're not necessarily looking at the voltages as they cruise around. All right? Okay, so we need inputs and outputs. The reason that we kind of lump the inputs and the outputs over here underneath program memory and data memory, it's not by chance. What we need to do is we need to architect the whole memory system to have a way that we can consistently access it. And the way that you consistently access memory is you have it memory mapped into an address. So there's going to be addresses for the program memory. It might be 0 to 10. And then you might have addresses for the data memory, 11 to 20. And then you're going to assign addresses for every single input and output port. So maybe address 21 is your monitor, 22 is your mouse, 23 is your keyboard, okay? But that's the way you handle inputs and outputs, is they are given an address, and that allows you to read and write to them just like you read and write to data memory, okay? All right, this feels pretty good, huh? Hmm? How's it feel? Yeah, thumbs up all the way around.